All right, everyone, welcome. Um, some people are coming in. I know uh, uh, I'm already getting the the text from everyone. So if you uh, if a connection goes out or power goes out, uh, we know. And even Riley said he means storms where she is. So um, yeah, we will we we will be able to have the, the recorded version of this um, you know available. And I'll stay active for if you get kicked out or something due to connection, come in. So um, welcome. I know we have players from uh, from the Windsor and you know, all over Windsor and London area to our, our Tecumseh talks. I think this is like our 12th, 12th one of these. Um, we're very, uh, consider ourselves very lucky um, to have another goalkeeper join us, uh, you know, of uh, Riley stature. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to waste too much time introducing you, Riley, because I think it, uh, you tell the story much better. So, uh, you know, I turn it over to you and, uh, you know, here's uh, Riley Foster, a uh, professional goalkeeper with, you uh, Currently with Liverpool FC, and I'll uh, I'll turn it over to you, Riley, and let you tell your story and more introduce yourself. So. Yeah, so I'm Riley. Um, I grew up in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, played from the youth level of like Timbits and stuff in Cambridge, um, and just kind of grew up with my dad coaching me and stuff like that. Like most of you might have experienced. Um, from there, I just kind of explored different coaching styles and different types of teams. Um, I went into uh, the Mississauga area, so I played for North Miss, um, played with them for a couple of years, and then came back down towards you guys and played for North London for a little stint, and then went to Burlington, played with Burlington for a little bit, a year up, um, and then started got, getting introduced into the provincial program, so when I joined the provincial team, we were removed from our clubs completely for 11 months of the year, um, and just basically trained seven days a week in uh, Toronto. Uh, from there, I also played, um, and when the Burlington girls graduated on to go to college and stuff, I dropped down to my age again and played with Woodbridge. Um, and that's when I did a lot of showcasing, um, just kind of traveled around, still with the provincial team. So I was only with them for a little bit of the time. And then basically um, transitioned from provincials into the national team. So my national team experience started when I was 15 years old. I was playing two years up in the 17 age group. Um, my first tournament ever with them was an unexpected experience for me. I went to a camp in Florida uh, to prepare for Jamaica qualifiers for the World Cup in uh, Costa Rica. And I was expecting to go home and go on vacation with my family, actually. I thought there's two goalkeepers ahead of me. You guys spoke to Devin Kerr. Um, and there's another girl who is Patricia Catullis. And I thought, you know, they're older than me. They're more experienced. They're going to college soon. I don't think I'm going to be on the roster. My parents bought me a plane ticket to go to Jamaica with them on a vacation. Um, and then from there, we were in Florida and they cut a player and a goalkeeper. And I was waiting for the email to say, come, come to the room and have a chat, but I never got the email. So I texted my parents and said, have fun in Jamaica. I'll see you there, but I'm not going with you. Um, so that's how my national team experience has started. So going to that tournament, I thought, mm, I'm not going to play. I'm just going to get all this experience from these older players. I'm going to learn a lot. I'm just going to enjoy the experience being in a different country, seeing other teams play. It'll be so much fun. Um, it comes to be like three days before the game and they do the Jersey presentation and I'm the number one kit. Uh, I thought they, they're, they're crazy. They're mistaking something. I don't know what's happening. Um, but that was kind of like my pedestal of uh, success. And that's where from that moment on, I took the mentality of being an underdog and just working hard, learning from the people above me and around me and just appreciating the journey. Um, and it kind of just set me on this journey that I'm on now and to the success that I have today. So in that tournament alone, we qualified for a World Cup, but I also was the best goalkeeper in the tournament, all tournament team, and helped like our whole team qualify. And to me, that's just priceless to be able to do that with some girls that I've grown up with in the provincial program and club environment. Um, and it's just kind of fun to have that uh, journey and actually have a massive impact and uh, part in it. Um, then national team, I right after that tournament, I got called into the U20 cycle. Uh, with the World Cup in Canada, and I was on the bench for that. And I got to, that was my experience where I got to sit there, just take it all in, be at a home World Cup, um, and just learn so much from Kaylin Sheridan. I uh, played like Kadisha Buchanan, Ashley Lawrence, all those players were on that squad. And I got to sit there, watch them train, learn from them, learn how they play the game, um, kind of grow from there. Um, and then after that tournament, we went to Costa Rica uh, and had a World Cup, uh, in the World Cup. And we went to the quarterfinals, unfortunately did not uh, succeed further than that. But again, to be able to go to a World Cup at, at the time, I think I was 16, maybe 15, um, was a big deal. So that was a big highlight of my career. And then from there on, I transitioned um, 
into college shortly after. So being a Canadian, going to an NCAA school and a full ride scholarship is a big deal. And I was very fortunate enough to get a full ride to West Virginia University, which I'm sure some of you might know um, as a very big D1 school. Um, I was able to play with Kadisha Buchanan, Ashley Lawrence, um, Ambedin um, Pierre-Louis, um, some of the top Canadian players at the time that were from the U20 cycle that actually made it to the senior team. Um, from there on, I had four years and three, I did four years or four seasons and then graduated in three and a half with the master's in, or sorry, a major in sport management and a minor in social media and coaching. Um, in my time at college, I learned so much and I think it's one of the best experiences that I've ever had. Um, not necessarily just to play the game, but to learn a lot about myself, about what I need to succeed um, as an individual away from the game, but also as an athlete. I was exposed to a lot of different challenges mentally and physically that uh, enabled me to grow and learn so much about myself. Um, during that time, I was actually transition I was full time with the U20 team as well, with the national team. So I had a cycle my freshman year where we went to Papua New Guinea World Cup, um, lost three games in a row, and I came back and had to go hop into the national championship matches for West Virginia, where we actually went to the well, the national championship, lost to um, South Carolina, but made it all the way to the finals, which was a big deal for us. It was the first time in history, um, part of a record-breaking team, and Keisha Nash's last time in university, which was amazing. Um, had a very good career um, after that. My last three seasons were amazing. Um, learned so much from different players, experienced different types of challenges. And then uh, my second year, got to captain the U20 team that was trying to qualify for the France World Cup. Unfortunately, we didn't qualify based on a, an uncalled for a penalty situation um, against Mexico. But from there on, um, we just kind of grew. Um, and now, graduate college, I signed a professional contract in January with Liverpool FC. Um, I'm on contract with them for 18 months. So I have another 12 months now. Um, and basically, I'm just kind of learning like I always have. I have that underdog mentality where I'm trying to just learn from the people above me and around me. Uh, work hard and try to earn my spot like I'm sure all you guys are used to but I've had so many different coaches some of you guys might know them some of you guys might not I've had a couple in um, in London I've had a couple all over the province but I've learned to take all the information from them and filter out what I may not use but utilize what the key information that they gave gave me and just apply it to my game and I think that's one of the most important things I've learned over the last few years is just taking what you can and applying it and then filtering out the other stuff that you may not agree with but just keep on amplifying your game. So it's been a long journey, but I'm still going. I hope I got another 20 years or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you, you know, you just touched on it. So since you just said, it, I want to, um, you know, some, some players I know, especially keepers, and we, we talked about coaches comfort with keepers. So um, yeah, what, what kind of one of the advantages would you say that's helped you playing for, a, you know, a group of different coaches or, did that prepare you better or how do you think that had a role in your success at, you know, at yeah. WVU and, and now signing pro? I think it's really important to challenge yourself in a sense. So for me personally, putting myself in different positions with different coaches, different philosophies, technique, tactical mindsets really helped me understand the game a lot more, exposed me to different theories and philosophies, but it also put me in a position where I had to be uncomfortable. And I think that's one of the most important things as a human in general is putting yourself in uncomfortable situations because you have to, you have to grow. And that's the only way you're ever going to grow is if you challenge yourself. So with those coaches, like I said before, it's just taking in the stuff that they say, you respect it, you understand it, you learn from it. But let's say your set position is more square and you want to keep your hands more in a neutral position where this keeper coach is telling you to keep them more low or wide or open. For me, I would just say, okay, you know, I respect it. When I'm at training with you, I'll, okay, I'll do what you want to do. When it comes to game time, I'm going to what I'm good at and what I'm more comfortable with. So it's just kind of filtering out that stuff and taking in, kind of coming with like a happy medium where you're just saying, okay, you know what, you're right, but this is not how I'm successful. Like I find I can get my hands up quicker if I'm in a neutral position, whereas I can't get them up as quick if I'm wider and lower. So that was one of the big things. And I think also tactically learning from different coaches has exposed so many different things to me like uh, being a massive student in the game and ooh, having so many different feedbacks and inputs of a game kind of just like exposes you to everything and I think that's one of the most important things whether it comes from formations um just how you play out of the back or just the general IQ of the game you just, just see so much more and learn so much more so 
at first it's stressful when you're like hopping back and forth from coach to coach to coach but to me it was just a massive learning experience that I can't like I can never say thank you enough for because I was able to be exposed and then when I transitioned to West Virginia I was able to apply my tactical IQ um, and soccer IQ and just kind of transition it and be able to be a coach on the field um, and really use my communication to drive the players and to help with the flow of the game and stuff which is so important as a goalkeeper. Awesome. Do you, did you always know this was your path? I mean, uh, uh, you know, we talked about that stuff. Like when did, when did you kind of know, or, you know, what was, you know, was there that, that kind of moment or was it just kind of happening or, you know, what was your, what was your uh, you know, mindset like as a kid? Um, so I'd say when I left Cambridge, I sat down with my dad and my mom in the kitchen. I sit on the counter and they just said, what do you want to do? Like, what, what are your goals? What's your path? Where do you, what direction do you want to go in? And at first I was kind of like 12 years old. I, I, I just want to play the game. But my 12 year old self said straight up, the five or four things I said was, I want to play professionally in England. I want to go to the Olympics in 2020 in Japan. I want to be um, a starter for the Canadian national team. And I want to go to school at UNC, which is University of North Carolina. I didn't go to school at UNC, but I still beat UNC and the semifinals and the national championship. So I guess that's even better. But um, that was a moment, I think, just saying it out loud and committing to it at such a young age. My parents were kind of like, geez, like, I don't know, the heck is she going to do that? Is that even possible? But my mindset at a young age was very, I'm very driven. I, I work on my own. I'm so independent. And at that moment, I just kind of committed to the, like, the game and I just let it happen. My parents supported me 100%. My family supported me 100%. My sisters have been along the journey with me every single time. They've sacrificed friends. They've sacrificed hanging out with, at home. They've come down the road trips with me. So it was a big moment. And when I started seeing my family start sacrificing so big, it was even more of a desire for me to do it even more. And I wanted to just keep on going like forward and keep on paying back what they've given up. Like my parents put their jobs on hold just so I can go up and down to the USA. So that was a big time for me to say, you know what? Yeah, this is the, this is the goal. This is a dream. And I, I just want to keep going. And now where I'm at today, it's, it's, yeah, I'm there, but how much further can I go now? I need to be the start of the Olympic team. I need to be on the roster. It's like, that's just the goals. I want to make history. I want to be a legend in Liverpool. So it just keeps on stacking up and I just keep on changing my goals and just keep on driving forward as I knock everything off the list. When you, um, first of all, like your story is amazing. So, so, and, and maybe I'll go and I'll try to not, and I'll try to take us off that. So when you talk about, you know, as a goalkeeper, we talk about the time you spend with, with goalkeeper trainers, what kind of goalkeeper training did you have? What kind of time? extra you know out of field time did you put in what was that like for you yeah so prior to even becoming a goalkeeper my dad did a lot of research on the women's game and he realized that it's very common in women to have bad knees because of the structure of our hips and just the genetics that we have um so right off the bat my dad was taking me down to churchill park here in cambridge right behind my house basically learning how to jump properly how to land properly structuring my knees properly and that was kind of the pedestal just the training that now puts me as a goalkeeper, which are the fundamentals of having a structure, like a solid foundation, not being unbalanced, having the strength and stuff. So that started at the age of, for geez, I was still playing for Cambridge at that time. So like I was very young, but now transitioning to a goalkeeper, my mom said out loud, I'm not having that goalkeeper that can't, can't save a ball. I'm not having the one that everyone laughs at. It's just, she's not going to be in my family. So if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. So immediately my parents hired a, well, they put me into elite athletes um, in Kitchener and that's, they had a goalkeeper clinic at the time. I just did that, um, which taught me the foundations, the set position, diving, throwing, you name that. Um, and that was twice a week, sometimes three times a week, depending on how much I could get there. And then when I started investing into the regional program, the district program, I had eight Hadzik, um, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, as my goalkeeper coach for two rounds of regionals. Um, and he was the best thing that's ever happened to me. He brought intensity and challenge into my life that I've never experienced in my life. I, I've never ever been pushed to my limits like Abe has ever pushed me. I'm talking about jumping over hurdles that are probably my height, um, doing somersaults and cartwheels across the goal and still trying to save five shots after that. Um, a very passionate dude that just brought so much um, energy to every session, but 
actually has completely sculpted my career today and how I train today. If it wasn't for him, I'd probably be the laziest goalkeeper ever. Um, he just brought the standard that I live by now. Every session I go into now is hard and tense. There's no off time. Um, and that's all because of how hard he, he worked to keep me sound. And then, um, sorry, my sister's about to walk through the door here. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, and then after that, after Abe, every goal, everywhere I went had a goalkeeper coach. So with the provincial team, we had a goalkeeper coach. We had goalkeeper sessions um, every day. And then on Saturdays or Sundays after our games, we'd have just only goalkeepers, all the goalkeepers in the province trained together. So I've had so many different influences in regards to that. But like I said before, it's all this, the foundational stuff that I learned at Elite, um, the foundational stuff my dad taught me just with stabilizing the knees. And then A, bringing that intensity that has basically shaped my whole career to now and has become my ID. Um, everyone knows me as a hard worker, very resilient person. And it's just because of what he has taught me when I was younger. Awesome. Well, can you give uh, what your kind of week looked like when you were, you know, a kind of young, young teenager, you know, or adolescent developing. You know? yeah. And I keep acting like that was a long time ago, but you're, you're, you're not, you're not old. You're still, you're still, you're still, I don't want to call you a kid. That's disrespectful, but to me, <laughs> uh, you're still, you're still, you're still young enough. So it feels like forever ago, I have to tell you, but um, I'll use provincials as an example, because that's what I can remember the most. Um, provincials was Monday to Saturday. Um, well, and Sunday. <laughs> and basically I would go to school in the morning, afternoon, I would leave class about 30 to an hour minute, an hour early, and then drive down to the, drive down the 401 to Vaughn, go to the OSA, be there by sometimes 4.30, 5 o'clock. Um, we'd have strength and conditioning in the beginning or after practice, but we had strength and conditioning for an hour and a half. And then I was on the pitch for two hours. Um, there we had probably an hour half an hour to an hour of goalkeeper specific and then you're brought back into the squad where they're doing their like shooting drills, whatever it may be, foundational, functional movements, whatever that is. Um, from there, you go either back in the gym or you're into meetings, um, film review. And then after that, it's basically drive back down the highway, go home, be home by probably 12 o'clock, wake up seven o'clock to go to school and repeat that all. On um, the weekends we had training so it'd be like a game against like either the u14s or whatever team was above you or under you and then you would basically as a keeper you just be put back into like goalkeeper training for the day so there's a lot going on in my house right now <laughs> so then basically from there you would just like go back and train and then get home around dinner time and then repeat for the following week so that was pretty hectic. When I was in college, it was a little bit different. Um, there's school, practice, workouts, and everything like that. But provincial stuff definitely prepared me for the hard grind of just not really getting any time off. So, you know, kind of going forward, and, and, and some people have now emailed questions and text. So, yeah, you can throw them in the chat to me, or you can, uh, you know, email or, or text. I know some, some people on here. And uh, um, so, did, did, was there ever a time where you felt overwhelmed, where you felt like it was a lot? Like, um, I know being in that program, like, was Bryant, Bryant, you would have been under Bryant. Is, is there any I'm surprised you got a day off? Um, that was nice of him. Uh, um, he softened up now. I don't know how much you talked to him now. So it's, it's funny to see that, you know, the evolution. But uh, yeah, is there, a, is there a time where you felt burnt out, where you felt like this isn't for me, where you felt a roadblock? Because you were a pretty ambitious you know, person, you know, at a young age. Oh, hold on. yeah, I gotta hold on. I gotta unmute you. Sorry. There, now you can unmute yourself. Sweet. Right. Um, sorry about that. My dogs are barking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think when I was in provincials, it was exhausting. Um, towards the end, like my second last year. I thought, is this even worth it? Am I even going to make it? Because it was just constant repetition of going up and down the highway, not sleeping well, and just the lack of energy. And I think at points I thought, you know, is it even worth it? Because I wasn't getting game time sometimes. It was very political. The soccer world is political. We all know that. But it was, it was a political battle that it just wasn't on my side at times or at the time didn't appear to be on my side. 
Um, I definitely used to think like, is it worth it? I'd have bad weeks and my dad said, do you even want to do this anymore? And yeah, I questioned it myself because it's a big commitment. And, and for me, I'm either hundred percent in or I'm zero percent out. You know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no in between stage for me. And when I, I actually got hurt in provincials, I broke my collarbone, um, completely compound fracture, eight, seven year displacement. And that was under Brian Rosenfeld's practice as a player. <laughs> um, and the comeback when I was told it was eight months recovery, surgery and everything, I just, there's no, there was no coming back from that. There's, I was like, no, there's, I'm missing, I miss national team camps. I miss the Pan Am games. Um, so I took like three weeks and I thought I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I'm just, I can't. And my parents thought I was crazy. I kind of got a slap side of the head, wake up a bit. Like you got to commit to this. And then I started getting on the phone with the national team. I just said, like, I, I told them what was going on. I thought, am I even going to be able to make it? If I recover, are they going to take me back in? And at that time, they said, you know what? The best thing for her to have, like, for her is to bring her back into camp. So when I was hurt. They brought me into camp just to watch it be around the environment. And that actually helped me so much because I got to see the goalkeepers that I was up against. And I thought, this is not fair. I, I should be there. Um, and they kind of just put a fire in my belly and it drove me even further. So what was an eight month recovery, I turned into four and a half, five months um, and just kind of propelled it out. I went to different institutes. I went to the Hulk Institute in London to get my uh, therapy, which is like well, world renowned for upper body um, injuries with the like motocross guys and stuff. And I said, fix me, I need to be on the field. And I actually was able to recover in time for the Pan Am games and be on the practice squad. So that was like a big moment and a transition for me where I said, you know what? I'm not my worst depression was real. I was like, I'm never going to play the game again. I'm never going to be the same again. Cause you're, you're at this ramp and all of a sudden you just hit a wall. You just like scale down. Um, but that turnaround was a big thing for me. Um, and it definitely was a moment of like, you, you want to do this. You're going to keep on doing this and every wall you face and every obstacle you overcome, it's just going to make you even better and you're going to be stronger and propel you forward. Well, that's awesome. And I think you've definitely overcome, you know, and, and I think a lot of youth players look at injuries as, you know, the, the be all and end all. And I think in, in the modern day, like you said, you got a lot of uh, awesome, you know, facilities and rehab, uh, you know, that can bring you back from it. Uh, you know, kind of to steer it towards how you ended up at, at West Virginia, you know, how did you balance, um, how did you balance school and soccer when you were in high school? And then kind of how did you end up at West Virginia? If you want to tell that, that, that story, what was your path there? Yeah. So when I was at West Virginia, or sorry, when I was in high school, I was with the national team full time, um, balancing the U-17s and the U-20s at the same time. I kid you not when I say this, I was absent from classes. I believe it was 103 days out of a whole, uh, a whole year. There's only like 120 or something, 180 in the school year. So I missed 50% of the school year. Um, I moved all my classes majority online and the ones that were in class, I just had to work with my, like my teachers and just kind of say like, I'm sorry, I'm gone for three weeks again or I'm flying out next week and I just came back this week. Um, it was very hectic and stressful, but to me, it was really important to learn how to balance it all. And when I learned it, I was able to actually set myself up for success when it came to college. I would be going to camp and you would have downtime every day in camp, which is like two to three hours. But I, most people would sleep, especially when you're with the older girls. They're all sleeping. They're all recovering because they're in college and their professors lighten their load. I was like, I need to graduate high school still. <laughs> I don't even out. Um, so I had to learn how to just grind. And when I'm at camp, I had to learn how to balance homework, training as an elite athlete, having to be on my top performance all the time because you never know what can happen. And then also trying to find out when I can do film. So I'm trying to balance getting my assignments done and all my workloads done because I'm already probably four weeks behind my schoolwork. Let's just be honest. I, I haven't been there. And now I'm like, I got to catch up on film. I got to learn this team that we're playing against. I got to learn the new formations. And to me, that was way more important. So sometimes I was like, school, if I don't graduate, I'll just, we'll just remember you later. But I need to focus on the game. So it's a very hard thing to balance. And then when I got into college, that was a big transition. And I'm going to tell you this, when you go to Division One college, it's impossible to fail. It, like you literally have to work hard to fail. Um, they have guidance, like athletic counselors, they have academic counselors, you have your coaches, you have your professors, you have tutors, you have mentors. Like, I had people making me schedules. And I, I was just like, I didn't have to do anything. I just had to show up. And that's like, you actually had to try hard to fail. So 
when I got into college, it was just a matter of, okay, work with the people that are provided for me, take advantage of all the tutors, take advantage of all the mentors, take advantage of all the meetings I can get, and then just kind of propel myself forward. Um, take advantage of the study hall times. Like I wasn't in school to make friends. I wasn't in school to have fun and party. I was in school to get my degree and to become a better soccer player. So it was at first hard to buy in because you're distracted by players who are just there to have fun. Like in America, not everyone's there to play the game. They're just there because they're all right and they can get away with it. And they get distracted by the partying and the friends and the social life. Whereas I had to figure out, okay, now I'm distracted by these people who want to do this and I need to focus right here. So that kind of balance of figuring out the happy medium of when can I take time away from the academics and the soccer and enjoy myself in college. And it honestly took me four years to figure that out. I, I didn't enjoy myself until the last, I'd say three months because I was doing well in the game, but I found a way to balance my school and my school got lighter because I would take like six courses in the summer and lighten my, like my seasons up. So that's why I was able to graduate quicker as well. So I just heavy load the summer enjoyed that time never really had a summer off i'd be at on campus all summer working out i'd come home for two weeks in between like spring season and summer and then just go back go to classes and then propel myself forward so it was definitely a commitment and and a lot of um sacrifices that had to be made to learn how to balance it all but it paid off i was able to graduate early and now i was able to hop right into the professional environment Um, what advice would you have for, for players wanting to get looked at or wanting to get identified? I mean, what was your recruiting process like? Or there's players in the, in the decision process. I know you were somebody who had options. Is there, yeah. is there advice you would give to yourself and that's it? Yeah. So um, I have a different path. I, I was exposed to the national team environment. I was a starter uh, for the national team traveling and that brought a lot of attention, but prior to all that, um, when I was with Burlington, one of the re main reasons why I joined Burlington was their showcasing ability. Casey Downing was an excellent showcaser. He brought his teams to the top like showcases and he was exposed to a lot of coaches and had a lot of connections. So I went to like Disney showcase. I think I went to um, one in Indiana, New, like New Jersey area. I was exposed in that way. So that's how I kind of got my basis of the coaches knowing who I was. And from there, you create your emails, you send out your videos, you do all that kind of stuff. And you just kind of create those relationships. For me, I was able to call the coaches and if they answered the phone, we could have a conversation. They can't call me, but I know now, and that was at whatever age like I could do that. And I, I was talking to coaches in eighth grade. So now I think it's, you can't even really talk to them until you're in 11th grade or something like that. It's a lot more different, but I think the biggest advice is, especially during this time. And I was telling other goalkeepers that like, I've been mentoring is, or any player really is you create videos of yourself training, like advertise yourself, showcase what you can do, um, email the coaches, just keep tabs and sort of like, this is what I did this week. This is what my schedule is coming up. Um, I see that you guys are implementing this into your team. Just kind of keep your tab and say that you're following, keep interested, especially if you already have that relationship. But one of the biggest things is just staying on the ball with your training. If they can't see you play a game, maybe just record your, your training sessions. Like for me, as the, I was always remembered this is, one of the most important things for a goalkeeper in general is the warm up. Coaches don't, you don't see much in a game. Like if you touch the ball, you're lucky, especially if you're on a really good team. So your warm up is one of the most identifying things that a coach looks at. So go do your warm up that you would do before a game and record it, send it to them, say, this is what I do before games. This is how I get ready. Um, and it actually shows all things. You're gonna see your distribution, you're gonna see your diving technique, you're gonna see crossing, you're gonna see all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you can send it to them. Um, but in general, it's just, being active, being involved, showing you're interested, build the relationships and don't crash and burn. If you get a bad response because you know, they're just not into it. That's okay. Move on to the next. There's so many schools in the U S whether it's division one, two or three or JUCO or NAIA. There's so many opportunities and there's so much money out there that they want to give. Um, it's just finding it and just creating the right things. Don't be so dead stuck on. I need to go to these top five schools because this is X, Y, and Z. You got to remember that your academics matter too. And there's so many good academic schools that people just don't talk about because they just don't have a great soccer team. But reality is there are some teams that I've played against that have put West Virginia University to the challenge and they were like, I've never heard of them before. So you guys, you got to remember that just because it's not a big name doesn't mean there's not an opportunity for you. And to be fair, if you have an opportunity to go start right away at a team, why not take advantage of that, especially when you're in the NCAA? Um, so that was kind of my process with that. I think that's definitely, you know, that, Last message leads me to my next question. You, you, you talked about 
you know, playing time and stuff. What do you, what do you think looking back, what do you think goalies, uh, goalkeepers, especially, cause it's a little bit different should consider when making a decision for post-secondary school, you know, the stuff on field and off field. Yeah, I think it's really hard as a goalkeeper in the club environment. Most of you guys are probably starters and any player in general, you're all probably starters right now. You're probably the star of your team. Um, if not the captain, whatever it may be. So you're coming on this like high, you're like, I'm the queen, I'm the king, whatever it may be. And then it comes down to going to school and coaches are promising, oh yeah, you're going to come and be a big influence on our team. We're going to need you as an impact player. You're going to start, you're going to need all these minutes. Don't listen to that. It's not for sure. <laughs> it's called the best sales pitch ever. My friends and I, we relate to the used car sales pitch. They got to get the car off the lot. They just want to bring you in. And once you get there, if you're not showing them that you're great, or let's say you just have a bad week, whatever it may be, you're basically a write-off to them until you prove you're, you're great. So in my opinion, the best thing to do is just keep working hard. Keep yourself in their face. Um, in my school, there was extra workouts every day, extra lifts, extra training sessions. If you just you had access to the field, go on the field and do it yourself. They're watching. They have cameras. They know who's in and out. Like, take advantage of those extra workouts, especially as a freshman. Get on campus early if you can because – those little things are to show your commitment and drive to be better and to commit to the team. Um, when you're put in a place where as a goalkeeper, there's already a senior goalkeeper because in all reality, in most universities, Canadian and American, seniority matters. Um, they're going to probably play the one they're comfortable with. And I was having this conversation with you before. People like to be comfortable. They don't want to take risks and stuff. So as a goalkeeper that's coming in as a freshman, um, you may not be having as much experience. You're playing against players who are now four years older than you. Um, it's a big change. So you just got to take, like, appreciate your role, help the team out. One of the biggest things that I, as a captain of West Virginia, I said, my freshman, when they came in, I had a meeting with everyone. I said, I don't care if you're the next big thing, if you're Christine Sinclair, I don't care who you are. Whatever your role is in this team, you got to impact this, like, you got to impact everyone else. So bring a positive uh, mindset, bring a good outlook on everything, and just make sure that you're driving people forward. Um, if you're not going to do that, then there's no value to this team. And from there, they kind of just said, oh, okay. And you kind of give them that like ownership of saying, you know what? You are great. You have the opportunity to impact everyone. But how you do it is what's important. And you're going to get players that are just going to slump and they're going to be mad at the world because they're not starting or whatever it may be. Um, but those players that, that have a voice that, that encourage you to run and practice, they constantly work hard. Um, those are the ones that are important to the team. Those are the, those are the engines, and that's what you need. So whatever role you take, just make sure you're you're using it properly and you're using your platform as a good way to just be a good influence. And those players are the ones that get the best opportunities. Um, they may not feel like it at the time, but they really do. Oh, awesome. Awesome. What kind of dog do you have? Three people have asked me that. Oh, this is Kaya. This is my Morky. Um, she's the one I got at school. She's a Maltese and a Yorkie. We also have a boxer, and then there's a Yorkie in the house cool. too. It's a zoo in here. <laughs> that's awesome that's Kaya. awesome and my sister <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome huh? yeah um yeah it's it's the new normal right you just like yeah. see, what, see what comes in the background so um when you talked about you know being a leader and obviously there's a lot of dependent uh you know a lot is dependent upon uh um goalkeepers in terms of leadership qualities and and communication some of our goalkeepers and the other talks have asked you know how did you, how did you embrace your, you know, we might have kids who are shy or at a young age. How do you embrace that leadership position? And how do you really, how do you add communication to your game? Can you maybe talk about the role communication plays? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. Is that something I am, if you can't tell, I could talk a lot. Um, I like to talk my voice. I like the sound of my voice, <laughs> but being a goalkeeper, your voice is so crucial. I think already you're put in a position where you're under pressure. You, you see it all, but you, you got to find a way to explain that and you got to find a way to express what you see. Um, one of the hardest parts of my career was figuring out my voice and how to use it properly. Um, so I think the foundation of communication is knowledge. Until you understand the game thoroughly, it's very hard to communicate. And one of the things my dad did when I was young was he, before I became a goalkeeper, because I really wanted to be a goalie, and he thought, no, um, he played me in every position on the field literally every position. He said, if you're going to be a goalkeeper, you got to know everything. You got to know how and what the expectation for each role is. And that was at a very young age. And he taught me 
everything about that. And then he said, okay, now you know it, now you can communicate it. Um, and the other part was I was watching games every weekend, every day possible. Anything that's on TV, whether it's Liverpool or not, I was at the screen watching it because at the end of the day, I was learning so much from the game. Um, and that was what helped me actually be able to communicate and give me my voice power. There's one thing about saying like, oh, step up or away. <laughs> but there's another thing of actually communicating like content. Um, it's about telling the line to ship, when to ship, when to drop, telling your midfielders and passing on a message of when, who needs to tuck in. Once you know all that information, it comes so easy and it just becomes fluid. Um, at the end of the day, your role is to communicate. And if you don't communicate properly, the ball's going to be in the back of the goal. And it's going to be on you because you didn't say the right things or you didn't use your voice to say man on or turn or whatever it may have. The smallest thing could have been. So use that power. Use your voice as a, as a big platform. Sorry. <laughs> and use that big platform that you have because at the end of the day, your what you see is what no one else sees. The coaches can't see how you see. The players can't see how you see. You literally see it all. And if you can't communicate it, then you're kind of not helping your team. You're hindering their performance. At the end of the day, you got to do whatever you can to like, just elevate it. Um, I had so many players hate me, literally hate me because of my communication, because they just couldn't handle being criticized or just being demanded of greatness. And that's on them. If you can't handle it, but don't stop doing your job because your players can't handle communication. Um, they can't handle positive or constructive criticism is the best word. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, if they aren't willing to receive that and just kind of filter it, that's on them. Um, so I think communication is so important. It's one of the biggest things you learn. I think right now, if you're listening to the German league, you can hear the players communicate and that's the best thing ever. I like, I actually prefer the games like this. You can actually hear the culture on the field and it's so interesting. And I think if it's your player right now or a goalkeeper, then you want to take advantage of every situation like that and just hear it all, learn from it. Um, and just kind of take it what you can apply to your game. Oh, that's awesome. And I think that's, you know, great. When you talk about um, uh, the, uh, uh, the relationship with some of your teammates, um, you, you've always been a driven, you've always been a driven from, from a kid to now, you know, when you're beginning your career, did you feel like, you know, did you feel left out sometimes? Did you feel like you were different? And, and, and if so, how did you, how did you deal like that? How um, did you deal with that? Yeah. <laughs> different is a good word. Um, all my life I've been told. I mean, we're all, we're all weird. We're, we're, yeah. we're goalies. We get it. Like we're all weirdos on this call. That's okay. So I, I just more because of how driven you are too. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, all, it's funny to say that all my life I've been told I was just a little off, different, weird, you name it, awkward is the best word. And my parents would say it as my mom walks through right now, she would say, I'm just like the complete, <laughs> the complete awkward person, the weirdo of the family. And my friends would say that you just didn't fit in with any group or anything like that. And to me, I was kind of like, what's wrong with me? I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm outspoken. Yes. But what, what was their issue? And I think the hardest part was kind of accepting it at first, but then when I got to college was my, my eye opening experience. I learned a lot about who I was, what I brought and why people didn't receive my messages or just who I was the individual. And most of the time it's because people don't like, people who speak out about the truth or just say what it is. And as a person, I just say it how it is. I don't really have a filter. I am respectful in it, but I just, I'm not going to hide the truth from you. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm going to be direct with you and people hate confrontation. So as a goalkeeper, I'm just a very direct person. I say what I see and that's just my job. So having to filter that and transition and be a human on the other side and say, like have a conversation with someone, it's very challenging. So when we talk about being different, yeah, it's my whole life. But it, it, you're a goalkeeper. If you're putting your face in front of a ball, you got to be freaking crazy. Like, it's just not normal. Um, but it's all about embracing that. And I think one of the best things I've done is embrace who I am and how I am as a person. Um, by doing that, I've become so much more confident on the field and so much more vocal and instructive in a positive way. Um, I don't think if I was negative towards how I was, my communication would not be positive. Um, it wouldn't have meaning and it would be more aggressive rather than constructive. So I think it's all about embracing who you are. And I think that's just the motto for life. Just enjoy it, embrace it. You can't change who you are. You are who you are. You can change how you talk or you can change what you look like, 
But at the end of the day, your personality is what drives you. And we talk about driven personality and that, that's just me. Um, if people didn't like me, uh, that's their fault. I just walk away and keep on going. Like, you're not going to affect me. I'm not going to let you get in the way of my goals and my dreams. So enjoy that. <laughs> I think that's great. And I think, yeah, as goalkeepers, we all understand we have to embrace who we are. We're going to be a little bit different. And uh, especially when you're, when you're very driven um, mm-hmm. and you have high expectations. So, so something we ask everyone, what, what's, what was your favorite part or has been the favorite part of, of your career, your youth career, um, you know, to this point, is there a favorite moment or a highest moment you've had, you know, and, and you know, what was that? Like? Ah, that's a good question. So I've had a lot of highs, but I've had a lot of lows. So that's, they all kind of balance each other. Well, that's my next, that's my next question. So go ahead. So <laughs> start with those. Start, start with the... I'll start with the highs then. So um, I'll name off three. Um, I talked about Jamaica. That was a really big moment and a massive pedestal for my career. That kind of just drove me forward and took me to the next level. Um, and made me realize that I'm good enough. It wasn't like, oh, you're just this younger player. It's, you can do this. Um, and that just set my mindset even stronger, made me just work even harder. Um, that moment was also for me one of the best moments because that was my last time my grandma got to see me play. She was actually there in Jamaica with me. So to have her kind of experience a really good tournament um, and one of, that, that was a high of my career at the time, and for them to be there was a very big deal to me. Um, the next one I would talk about is Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica, oh no, sorry. Trinidad Tobago U20 qualifiers for the World Cup in France. We did not qualify, but personally, I was captain of that team and I, my grandfather died. I literally landed in Trinidad and my parents called me saying granddad died. So that tournament was just a platform for me to go, okay, you know what? This is the adversity I have to deal with, but how am I going to change it into um, something great? And for me, I had one of the best tournaments in my life. Performance was out of the roof. Um, saving PKs against Mexico in the middle of the game, just an amazing tournament for me. Um, coming back into college after that and just training hard, getting fitter. It was just a really good way to tr- like put my mindset. And people may say, oh yeah, we just shoved everything in the back of your mind and just kind of pushed through. But to me, I was just like, no, it's just another part of the life. It's part of the career. Um, it's just what you got to expect because there's going to be times where I'm going to be in England and something's going to happen and I just can't make it back home. And that was just an example of that. Um, and then my third one would be when I was in college, um, not this season, the past season, we won the Big 12 tournament. Um, we won because, I, I won't say because of me, but I made some crucial saves in that game. And that was a, t- a turning point in that season for me to say, you know what, I mean, I'm here for the team. And they kind of respected who I was. was like I said, we talk about awkwardness and stuff, but that was a team that just couldn't accept me for who I was. Um, and that moment, they all relied on me. And I came and I showed up. And I said, you know, I'm here for you guys. I got your back, but you got to start like respecting me. And that was the pivotal moment. Um, there's a picture actually from the big 12 tournament when we won, where we present with the trophy and the coaches gave it to me. And in the picture, I'm holding it up on my head. And it's just that moment of not, it's not even about the trophy. It's not even about holding it, but it's like the, the team rallying beside me and saying, you know what, we're with you. We're going to do this with you because I was this person that just drove mindset, mindset, mindset. And I was just against the grain, no fun uh, training only. But then they kind of bought into it and we had a really good like good cycle with them. So that was like three top things that have propelled me forward. Awesome. Yeah, before I get into the, the, the lower moments or the moments we felt we had to come back from, uh, what do you think comes first? Do you believe in yourself or others believing in you? Oh, believe in myself all the way. Because it, there's been so many times where people did, just didn't have any faith. My parents, they didn't think I was going to be great. <laughs> they thought me going to my like, team Canada was like, oh yeah, just another kid doing that. But it's, you gotta believe in yourself because at the end of the day, when no one else believes in you and the like adversity is circling, all you have is you. I, I was put in isolation completely by myself in England for two and a half months. There's no one there. I knew no one. All I had to do was believe in myself, believe you know you can get through this, push yourself, push your mind, push your physicality, whatever you can do to be better. And that's what exactly what propelled me forward. That's awesome. Is, is, do you, is there someone or something that put that that message inside your head or do you think you've always had that from a young age um I think it's from a young age but I think what my mindset comes from is my parents sacrifice so I mean many people have been born to families that are very privileged um the, the struggle wasn't always the same as everyone else's my parents literally had nothing um 
we've lived in the same house all our life, but they've worked so hard for what they've had and they've taken the shirt off their back for all three of us um, and just kind of just sacrificed every little thing. And I tell you what, they put their like careers on hold. My dad's just kickstarting his career now and he's just finding his success and he's risen in the last five years. And the last five years when I was at school, my mom is a, a now like a region like renowned real estate agent because she's had the time to focus on her career. So the sacrifice that they gave me kind of just said like their hard work and their ethic, they never say die attitude. They never complained once. Um, they never blamed me for any of the struggles. It was just always, uh, we're going to get it done. We don't know how we're going to get it done. So that's kind of what I think has put my mindset the way it is. But just, just the overall grind, I've just been a very consistent and very adamant person. There's just no, like, I'm very straightforward, black and white. I, I'll add some color in sometimes, but it's black and white for me. Um, and I think that mindset of just always being like, my mom says like OCD. I think she's crazy for saying that, but that kind of like mentality has helped me kind of propel myself forward, just being consistent and driving that and then taking what my parents have taught me and just applying it to my everyday life. That's awesome. Okay. So now to go into it, is there, is there a moment, a low moment that, that you feel comfortable sharing or a moment where you felt extreme, you know, extreme adversity where maybe you didn't think you were going to get past it or, or you needed help, you know, and how did, how did that affect you and how'd you, how'd you come back from that? Yeah, I think I discussed my broken collarbone with you guys. That was probably one of the toughest moments of my life. Um, being young, being my first major injury and not even a major injury where it's like a sprained ankle, it's a bone out of your skin. <laughs> There's no like mistaking that and being told that you have to be off for eight months and you know, like, these eight months are crucial for development and recovery. And, and I just, that to me threw me off. When we talk about mental health issues, I wasn't even attending school. I couldn't even get myself to get out of bed. Like it was bad. Depression was like a real thing there. And I've always been like, oh, you're fine. But that moment I was like, wow, like I'm going through it. <laughs> it took a conversation. I think we were at Swiss Chalet at the time with my parents and they were like, what is wrong with you? And I just broke down in the middle of the restaurant crying um, and that's when I started being honest about how I felt and open. I'm, I'm very like hold my emotions inside, but that's when I started vocalizing how I felt and it changed the game for me. Um, I lost both my grandparents, uh, losing my grandfather uh, when I was in Trinidad was traumatizing. Um, that was like my backbone of my family, my dad's dad, my English roots. So having to lose him when I'm in the middle of a tournament was absolutely tormenting. Um, I've never experienced anything worse than that. And having to switch from being upset but now I'm a captain of a team how do I not be selfish right now um what's one of the hardest things and the coaches kept on telling me like do you need time do you need this and I was just no just plow forward and having to push all that back in my mind and deal with it another time was very just like struggling and then I think the ultimate struggle in college um I got diagnosed with a disease my very first day on campus <laughs> I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called Gray's disease which basically is hyperthyroidism, but I had three tumor-like cells on my thyroid. Um, couldn't run, couldn't jump, couldn't do anything, but I still had to play games. So my training was minimized to like three reps max every five minutes. Uh, I couldn't do anything. And then having to be on medication for life and then going back and forth to the national team, the 20s, they had World Cup that year. We had Australia um, series that year. I was just trying to manage school, being sick, being away from home for the first time. That was like, am I ever going to get out of this battle? Like, is it ever going to go right? Because it didn't feel like it was going right. Um, but that was actually one of the best years. I went to the national championship. Um, we lost in the World Cup, but that's beside the point. We lost 5 nothing, 3 nothing, and then 5 nothing again. Um, so that was like a little burn. But I came back after that tournament and was able to play against Duke and make the game-winning save. The reason I went to the national championship. So every low for me has had some major highs um, and has kind of propelled me to who I am today. But I say those three things are some major adversities that I've dealt with emotionally and mentally um, and obviously physically. <laughs> awesome. I, I wasn't sure, you know, thank you obviously for opening up and sharing. I wasn't sure if you're, how deep you're going to get into some of those things. <laughs> um, so uh, as, uh, since it's uh, well publicized, do you want to share kind of the story and, and, and uh, share your tattoo? Oh, yeah. So it's covered up right now because I'm wearing a long sleeve and my dog's probably covering it too. But um, <laughs> so my grandma passed away after Jamaica in December and they were from Liverpool. My grandparents were both from Liverpool. Uh, they grew up in Waver Tree, came after the war um, and kind of settled in Canada. 
you'll never walk alone it's a chant of liverpool their anthem the players walk out on the pitch the whole stadium sings it it is goosebump chilling just breathtaking i've experienced it one time when they played against atletico in the champions league the last few season so far and it was just the most amazing experience of my life but um i got that tattoo in, in remembrance of her but it, it has so much more meaning to me in the sense where yes like you'll never walk on because my favorite team my family's heritage but it's also the idea of not being an individual person all the time and saying you got uh, taking the world on your shoulders that's one of my biggest issues so that was just kind of a reminder that saying like they're with me every step of the way um my family's with me every step of the way and it's just you're not alone um that song is if you listen to it it's just so it has so much meaning and so much like met metaphors in it that it's just kind of related so much to my life at the time and then being a Liverpool fan obviously it amplified the meaning <laughs> So, so, you know, we talked a little bit before about your agent. Uh, how does that go when you have that tattooed on your arm and you're trying to, you're trying to make the move to Liverpool? How, how, how tough are those negotiations for your agent knowing, knowing where you wanted to end up and how did you, and maybe you can tell the story of how you ended up to Liverpool, but you know, yeah, it's so, so fitting and so, and so poetic. Yeah. So my agent is um, technically related to me. He's my dad's second cousin. So my cousin, um, he's from Liverpool as well. So he's also a Liverpool supporter. Um, what happened was he, he said to me, okay, so I know you want to play in England, but where are some clubs that you're interested in? Like, obviously I've done my research. I've looked at the clubs, looked at the players, their success rate and stuff. And I didn't even say Liverpool on my list. I said, Chelsea, I wanted to go to Tottenham. And I think I said like Man City or West Ham. And he goes, not Liverpool. I said, I don't think I can get there. Like, I don't think I'm, I need more experience to go there. And I was like, and he was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll hit them up anyways. I'll get a hold of them. We'll share your like profile with them. We'll share your video with them. And then from there, we'll see. Emma, hey, Emma Humphreys is the assistant coach. I don't know if you guys know who she is, but she worked in the Whitecaps in Vancouver, um, Bev Priestman's wife. And Bev Priestman is the senior assistant coach of the English national team. So having that kind of connection with Emma and Bev was an, a, another voice to say, you know what, you need to bring this girl in. Um, it gave me another platform. So at the end of the day, when I had three options on the table and I decided which team I wanted to go to, I said, I can go to a team where I'll, I'll play right away, I'll not get paid as much, um, live in London and, you know, just have a good time or I can go somewhere and make history. Um, so the whole idea of going to Liverpool was not only to play for my favorite club, but to become a legend. I don't know if you guys know what legends are in the game of soccer, but these are players that have basically been with the club since day one and they've made history. They've been through the tough battles, the ups and downs, you name it. Um, and that was my goal. I said, I want to be the first female legend. And if I can't be the first, I want to be a legend. Um, so the emphasis was, you know, I'm going to stick it out for my career here. I'm going to work hard. So when we got relegated last week, I was like, oh dear, like now this is a big curveball. We're not in the first division, but this is now part of the story. This is how we get the whole, um, the whole structure of my, my journey. Um, my agent was all for me going to Liverpool as much as things were swirling. We were in relegation about the time. It was the idea of making a great impact and connecting with the fans, um, connecting with the fan base. That was easy for me to connect with because my connection with the team and my tattoo, I became like world renowned on Sky Sports. Like it was massive. I've never, there's never been a female ever broadcast like that. And I was like, I don't know why they broadcast me. I'm not even going to play. <laughs> but from that moment, it was just, it was an honor and then having to go to Anfield for my photo shoot. And I was like, hey, this is actually happening. So going to Liverpool was completely a fluke in a sense, because yeah, it's something I've always wanted, but I thought I would end my career there and not start it. But now I'm happy that I had the chance to start it and end there. That's awesome. And yeah, you touched on, uh, obviously, you know, the relegation was unfortunate and I saw your, your comments on that, but uh, you know, can you kind of share your, you know, your optimism of what's going on now when you guys return to training? Do you want to? Yeah. So I'm returning hopefully within a week. I'm waiting for my plan tickets to be sent to me. Um, the idea of me return earlier than expected is basically I'm going to get acclimated to the time zone again. I'll get back in my routine, get back in my schedule. Um, coming into the team, I was signed on as a practice player in a sense where, you know, you can work for your time. Like you can, you can get a chance on the field. You're going to get a game or so. But we want you to get used to the tactics, get used to the team, get used to the country and all that stuff. So my first six months of the last half of the season was solely for that purpose. Coming into this season now, it's okay. You're the second string for sure. The other goalie ahead of you is 
older than you, way older than you, has more experience in the league, but we want you to learn from her, experience and grow under her, um, and then be the, the, the messenger, you're the future sort of the, the club. You just gotta work for it, learn for it, and then kind of just take off. So my ambition going into this season, this preseason specifically, is just to work hard. Um, I'm going to be getting like personal training on the side, whether it's strength and conditioning, tactical, technical stuff, but also when I'm in training session with the club, what's up, dude? Um, <laughs> when I'm in training session with the club, it's just working hard, learning as much as I can. And I, I'm coming from like most of you will talk about the starting position to now not starting. I'm kind of making that transition. And that for me is really hard because I've always been a starter. And it's humbling because now you got to embrace the second rule. Um, I just got to take every opportunity I get with a grain of salt and just work my ass off basically excuse my French but that's just the reality I have to do um but I'm really excited for it because I get the chance to now become historical in this club being the team that got relegated and bring them back up and that to me is just another addition to the story that another chapter of the legend um and then hopefully from there my influence in the club my leadership mentality will help drive a new culture and bring a new game um and level to the whole team which is like the ultimate goal no, oh, that's awesome. And that's a message. And I think your, your confidence, like you said, I think it's very important as goalkeepers because, and I really like how you gave yourself credit in those games that I've, that I've seen, uh, that I've seen highlights from, and, and I know coaches have coached against you in college and you know, they'll attribute that to you. Uh, a lot of times goalies, we just are too used to always taking blame. So um, how do you deal with it an in game, uh, you know, mistake or moment where, uh, you know, th this question gets asked to all goalies that, that we have on. How do you deal with those low moments in games? How do you, how do you, uh, you know, get past them? Yeah. So, um, I think the mental aspect of goalkeeping and making mistakes is the worst thing ever. Um, I know we all probably struggle with it because at the end of the day, there's no one behind you to save the goal that's in the mesh. <laughs> um, and it's very lonely. There's no one else that can relate to that mistake. I struggled with it all my career until really college. And I mean, you're still going to struggle with it, but I worked with a sports psychologist yeah. heavily. Um, and basically we came up with a, like a, a system and a routine. So let's say I let a goal in or I make a bad mistake. It's, I give myself five seconds to think about it. And I say, okay, yeah, you really messed up. And then I clap my hands and it's done. Let's say we lose the game or the goal I have is bad. I give myself 24 hours after the game. And I basically don't look at film, don't look at social media, like Twitter specifically, or any videos. And then I, um, I'll go back after 24 hours, watch the film, watch the videos. And then um, whatever mistake I met, made, I'll make notes on it and make a session plan for that mistake and basically train that whole idea. And from there on, I'll just repeat every mistake. And then in training, if I make mistakes, I'm okay with because I'm like, oh, goal went in, but that's my spot to make mistakes. I, I'm not supposed to save them all in training. And I actually wish or hope that I'm making more mistakes than I'm actually perfecting. Awesome. I think, yeah, you're, a lot of goalkeepers have, have talked about the mistake ritual. So that's, it's awesome to hear that it's consistent as well. Um, do you have, uh, you know, what, what advice would you give to your former self? You know, I always like that question as we wrap up. You know, is there, you know, when you look back at yourself, you know, from eight to 10 years ago, you know, what would you tell her? And uh, what advice do you have? I mean, you, you took a different path. What, what advice do you have people that maybe their path hasn't, you know, accelerated that yet? Like you said, you had that pedestal moment. What advice would you have to someone, you know, whose path hasn't accelerated, yeah. oh, hasn't accelerated yet? Oh, one second. I'm just going to mute myself for a second. My dog is crazy. No worries. No worries. No worries. We really appreciate you letting us in us, us into your uh, into your life. <laughs> um. So, when it comes to advice, um, Jonas, you can go for the phone. You're fine. You're good. <laughs> um. When it comes to that kind of stuff, I think one of the biggest things that I would look back onto my career and say, okay, what would I change, or what would I tell myself when I was younger? And I think it was to work harder. Um. I don't think I appreciated the hard work and grind until. I got a little bit more mature, but I wish I, when I was in the provincial stages, I would have just worked hard and outworked everyone even more. And I think I had a hard workout, but I, I took times off. I took days off and I, sometimes I just had a bad attitude and I wish I would have gone back and, you know, taken that away. But at the same time, I don't really regret it because I am where I am. I've learned something from those mistakes. 
but I just wish I would have committed a little bit more, worked out harder, trained harder, whatever it may have been. Um, and I think for those that are on a different path or just on the same path, whatever it may be, on your own path, um, I think the biggest thing is to own who you are. Um, I think we talked about that really well. I'm also stay in the now. Um, there's no way you can control what happens tomorrow, what can happen in five minutes, what happened yesterday. Whatever happens, happens. And I think the best thing you can do is everything that you're doing, you treat it like your World Cup. Every training session is your World Cup match. It's your final match. And you got to take advantage of every single situation. And if you don't, then that's a lost opportunity. That's a lost learning experience. Um, so for me personally, that's something I live by. I have sticky notes on my computer that say stand and now. I have things all around my room that just kind of remind me and keep me like grounded in those moments. Because um, like I say, if you take a day off, you take a session off or you just – you just don't, you, you're worried about everything else that you can't control and you're so focused on the uncontrollables, you're going to lose that opportunity to learn and be great because you're so clouded and your judgment's like just not there. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things. And I also think just work hard. Hard work outworks everything. It outweighs every battle. At the end of the day, if I had a person who may not be as talented, but it's coachable and hardworking, I'm going to take that over the attitude kid who, yeah, she's all right, but she's not coachable. And she's not going to work hard. She's lazy. And she's just kind of like complacent with her role. So I think those three or two things are, are crucial to development. Um, and also just be a student of the game. Watch the game. I am watching the game all the time as much as I can. Um, it has helped me become so knowledgeable um, in the game. And I wouldn't regret that. I would just, I would hope people just want to keep on watching it because it will help you be successful in the, in the future and help you learn the game, help you communicate and help you with your position at the same time. Awesome. You know, I think that's great. And I think the, the stay in the now has been you know, a resonating moment. I also listening to you speak, uh, you know, just again, go, uh, you definitely have coaching in, in your career after your, after your playing career. And, uh, and I think goalkeepers make the best coaches. So, yes. so, and I, that's because I'm biased, but um, um, so, <laughs> Uh, you know, is there, you talked about the sports psychologist, is there any um, recommendations and, and cause we know goalkeeping is a, is, is a mental position. Um, this is the last question because it's been repeated a few times. Is there any um, uh, mental resources you found you use to help you set up that mindset that you have, um, you know, prior to having your own, you know, sports psychologist where you get more personal time? Yeah. Um, I do a lot of reading. I read like crazy. Um, one of the biggest things I get myself into is like books written by the Marines, like the crazy people that just do crazy things. Um, the latest book I read was You'll Never Walk by Andy Grant. He was an ex-Marine who was young, went to Afghanistan and got blown up. Um, he basically had the opportunity to amputate his leg at first, but decided not to and decided, you know, I'm going to make a comeback and I'm going to heal. He didn't. And he had his leg amputated. He became one of the world's fastest runner in the 10K. He won Olympic medals and he just set a massive platform in Britain. That mentality of the never say die, take whatever you can. You know what? He made a decision. He stuck with it. It didn't work out, but now he can fall back on the next decision and make something greater of it. It was something that I kind of re resonated with. And I've actually had the opportunity to connect with him since I've, he's from Liverpool too, which is pretty cool. Um, I've had the opportunity to connect with him on the side and just kind of know his story and his connections in the world. He's actually... Funny enough, really good mates is Jerry, Jamie Carragher. Um, and they talk, and they're from the same area of town in Boodle. But he talks about Jamie Carragher in the, in the book. And it's just, I read like that. And I also um, meditate a lot, like oh, just finding a wholeness in myself and just kind of keeping myself calm. Because as a goalkeeper, the world is crazy. Your mind is going a thousand miles per hour. It just never stops. And to kind of just come back to like ground and stay in the now, find what it is, and just kind of visualize um and just kind of learn about yourself in a sense that has helped me extremely um i do see a, a, a sports psychologist just because i mean if you're a goalkeeper you're crazy someone needs to bring back the craziness just a tad I'm just gonna knock it back a bit um not that that's what the psychologists are for but for me i was a little bit insane i didn't know how to cope with everything properly um and also just communication with my family and just the people around me and being honest with my coaches and just like the struggle is real. Like you're an athlete, you're going through it right now and you're going through it every day. And it's, it's a massive commitment to be where you are today. Um, and you're not supposed to be able to handle it all. You're not supposed to be able to take the world on your shoulders. So for me personally, it's learning how to talk to my dad, learning how to talk to my mom about how I'm actually feeling and what I'm struggling with, um, and training and just 
getting it out, like saying it out loud, because the more you think about it, the worse it gets, the worse your performance gets. But I find when I just spit it out and I just fucking, excuse me, let it all go. It's just like, whew, it's like a weight off my shoulders. Um, so those are like the main things that I found have helped me. I'm still learning. I'm still learning so much about myself as I'm growing into a different environment, into the professional career. That's what worked for me then. What's going to happen now? I couldn't tell you, but I'm definitely going to take those routines and practices and implement them to my game every day. Awesome. And, you know, the last question you know, for me before I close this up, cause I'm super grateful, you know, you've touched on, um, all the people who, uh, um, have helped you and kind of what you do for them. What, what, um, you know, do you think gratitude's, you know, is an important part of your life? And, and I think you've danced around the topic today, but I just kind of, I think it's, it has a lot of, uh, value in your life. So I'll kind of open that to you. What, you know, what do you think gratitude means to you? I think that's a good question. Ooh, that's like deep. Um, for me personally, it's, it's experiencing the moment, um, and the people who are within it and then paying it back and you don't have to pay it back in words. You don't have to pay it back in action, but it's just acknowledging it has happened. So the sacrifice that my family has made, I can always be grateful for, um, the, like the amount of gratefulness I have. It's, it's just, it's emotional, um, honestly, but for me personally, how I show my gratitude towards that is by constantly working hard, never giving up, being honest with them, including them in my successes. Um, because the ultimate, that's what they want. They want to see me succeed. They want to be there for me to the coaches who have had so much influence in me. It's speaking about them, speaking so highly about them because for example, Abe Hatzik has influenced my career tremendously and it's never letting his le like, legacy die. It's, <laughs> I know he's getting old, but it's just promoting all that greatness that he provided for me because that, that to me is what has set me for my career. And I, I can never thank him enough, but if I speak about it, I continue to like root in those, those mindsets and those challenges that he brought to me. And I bring it to every day in training, just have that mindset that he brought and that energy he brought every day. That to me is showing how gr like grateful I am for what he's brought forth and the gratitude I have for him in that sense. But I feel like it's, you can't just say, I, I have gratitude for this and I, I'm grateful. But when you put actions to your words, when you, when you live on it, that's really for me, what I, I think it means. And I think if you're religious or whatever it means, whatever you are, those actions are what kind of propel you forward. So I think that's a good question. Wow, that's deep. But it really is just basically how I pay it forward. Awesome. And, and yeah, in closing, I just wanted to say um, you've been one of the most, uh, you know, you've been giving back a lot, you know, and, and you can see it if anybody follows you on social media. And I think it's really cool because uh, your path, like you said, has been, uh, there's a lot of momentum on, on, your, on your career trajectory. And um, you know, you could easily uh, focus just on you. And I think you do a wonderful job uh, giving back to, you know, uh, to the young players, to the young keepers, to the young girls and inspiring them. And I, I think the more you share your story and it is very authentic and very real and very inspirational. So on behalf of everyone, you know, at, you know, at our club, Tecumseh Soccer Club, but everybody in Windsor, Essex and all the way up to London and, and, and wherever else, just want to say thank you. And then uh, kind of leave the you know, the final words to you, you've, you've, you've really dropped some, some serious nuggets on, on you know, on them. So, uh, you know, we're going to be, you know, clipping some of these quotes, uh, you know, it's been awesome. So, you know, the floor is yours. Do you have kind of a final message? Yeah, I think I just want to thank you all for being here and having me uh, on this call. I think it's really important for me to, like you say, give back. And a lot of people have asked me, why am I doing it? But there's so much I wanted to know when I was younger that I just didn't have access to um, the, the answers. I, I couldn't, I didn't have those connections, but in my mind, I want to build a connection with you all, the coaches and the players, because at the end of the day, I'm an open book, as you can tell. I, I have no filter, and I want, I want to share my story because there's so much to it that I wish I could just share with all of you. But ultimately, I can't be there in person all the time. Um, I will make my way there eventually, but I just want to just thank you for that opportunity. I want, want you all to know that because I'm not there doesn't mean you can't reach out. You guys will have my social media. Um, I'm very accessible. I see my messages. It might not get back to you guys right away. Um, a lot of players that I've actually connected with just from these type of calls, I've started mentoring um, through their journey to the college system. Um, and just, I'm mentoring this one girl from Nova Scotia right now who's just struggling. So whatever I can do to help you guys, it's what I'm here for. So don't be afraid to reach out. Any question is a great question in my opinion. Um, I probably ask the same question. If not, probably stupider, honestly, because I was a little bit ditzy back in the day. 
still am. But yeah, open book. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just, I can't wait to get back whenever I get back again, uh, whenever things are back to normal, hopefully soon um, and train with you guys because I think it'd be great to just put face and names and action to everything. But I have been paying attention to a lot of the goalkeepers that have been on the London Elite uh, GK website. Um, but yeah, whatever you guys need, I'm here for you. Just let me know. Awesome, Riley. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone who joined us on, uh, you know, on here and on the YouTube stream. You know, I really appreciate everything. And uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't storm too bad up by you. Like I said, it just came through us down here. So, uh, so you know, have a good night. And everyone, um, you know, thank you again so much for your time. So. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone.